for victory. This is the war of the two M's, mechanization and movement. Speed is vital in battle, and therefore equally vital is supply. If there's another M in war, it is mass. The fighting men on land and in the air need masses of everything. Machines must be mobilized as well as men. Machines to make and feed the insatiable appetites of the fighting services. What Britain doesn't manufacture, she imports. But she must build the ships to carry the goods. Britain's shipyards are busy. The blueprints of the designers and draftsmen are transformed in the yards to the steel hulls. Day and night, the clang of the hammers and riveting machines drum out a symphony of steel. Launches of both naval and merchant ships have become a habit instead of an event. Sometimes a new keel plate is ready to be laid as the ship takes the water. Thus are the losses being made up, and more than that, the Empire's sea lanes are kept open. The deadly torpedo is not the monopoly of the enemy. These tin fish are made by Britain in ever-increasing quantities, ready to speed on their way to enemy vessels. Vital aid from the air to the Empire shipping, as well as her armed forces, can only be sustained by the factories. Numbers must not be disclosed. But the obvious increasing strength of Britain's air might tells its own tale in the non-stop race for production. In countless factories, men and women put all their energy into output. Never in history was there a more famous machine than the Spitfire, which helped so much to win the Battle of Britain. These machines, and many other types, are being turned out by the thousands. The increase in aircraft demands the ever-increasing creation of aerodromes. Mechanized plants of every description is utilized. The thousands of acres of land have had to be leveled and drained, and miles of concrete runways laid. Think of the cement problem alone. <laughs> Requirements are kaleidoscopic and limitless, and so is production. The supply of parachutes is a huge item in itself. This work demands the highest degree of care, for on each individual operation someone's life may depend. these parachutes may one day rest the success of our military parachute operations when we take the offensive. Still on air matters, what are the ground defenses? The anti-aircraft guns. They too are being produced in enormous quantities in works dispersed far and wide. This line of barrels will soon be ready to drop many shells on the enemy. Not only are their majesties keenly interested in the increasing production, but officers in charge of anti-aircraft batteries, with many enemy planes to their credit, visit the factories where their guns were made to thank the workers for their skill. Maybe he has come to thank the women too. Vast numbers have been trained in this highly skilled work and take their places in the great national production effort. Tanks, too, are an essential arm of war. There's no limit to the numbers that we need. Lord Beaverbrook has asked for tanks, tanks, and yet more tanks, not only for us, but for our gallant Russian allies. Every tank is wanted for that great tank army we are building up. These are the men who are waiting for them and must have them. In our dominions, too, munitions are being turned out in large quantities. This is a South African factory making millions of cartridges for our machine guns and rifles.
South Africa is now making practically every article of war. Bombs by the thousand, shells by the hundred thousand. Another new departure, they're even making guns for their armies. Equally important, every bit of this material is produced in South Africa itself. An entirely new industry has been built up almost overnight. With a great fighting front in North Africa, the importance of this new situation cannot be overestimated. The rolling mills, too, are working night and day, making tough armor plate for armored cars. The busy workshops hum with the roar of machinery and the hiss of the welding plant as hundreds of armored cars and lorries are being produced and tested. India, too, is playing a great part. And those men with whom the king and queen are talking are trainees brought from India to a British factory to learn the job of making munitions in readiness for the time when they can return to train another army of workers in our great dominion. Australia, to equip their forces, the men down under are making every conceivable form of munitions. Anti-aircraft guns by the dozen, field guns of the latest type, the list is endless. And the work that is being turned out here is comparable with any other in the armament factories of Europe. Across the Atlantic, Canada is producing a multitude of Bren gun carriers. A non-stop flood is pouring out of their factories. Bombs by the thousands stream out of their huge works. Deadly TNT pours into these endless bomb cases. A nice mixture for Hitler and his dupes. 500 pounders, 1,000 pounders. There's no limit to the size and number that Canada is turning out today. Bombs, bombs, a multitude of beautiful bombs ready to be delivered just where they hurt most. When Mr. Churchill met President Roosevelt in the Atlantic, he had the supreme satisfaction of greeting an enormous convoy full of munitions and guarded by our fleet coming from the great Western democracy. Planes and tanks sent to us under the lease and lend act. Every one of these will be a headache for the Axis when our trained men get hold of them. Predictors by the score are arriving and filling our stores. High explosives by the ton slide down the runways. Bombs from America of every shape and size to fill our secret underground arsenal. Tommy guns by the thousand pass through our willing examiner's hands, both men and women. Field guns by the score are wheeled off to the depots where they're wanted. Thus, day and night, the might and power of democracy grows. Millions of tons of steel are being fashioned into instruments of war as the output climbs to the limit. A mighty flood of weapons is coming into being, for the Empire is building for victory. <laughs> <laughs>